Good morning and welcome to another Veterans Forum. Today the program is coming to you from the Derry Community Television Station here in Derry, New Hampshire. The date is 26th March 2014. This program is being brought to you in cooperation with the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. And we've been doing this since the year 2000. The idea is simply is this. We invite each and every guy and gal who served anywhere in any of the wars, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Venezuela, whatever. If you can and will, share those experiences with us here in this televised interview. It'll be put as part of the database in the Library of Congress. We'll give you a copy of the show for your own use. And it's a good legacy for your family because it answers the question most of the kids say to Grandpa. Hey, Grandpa, what did you do in the war? This is your chance to tell them. It's history that we're recording that's being made by the people who made that history. It's a good way of actually filling out a picture, of, if you will. It's a great big puzzle. And each one of us is a piece of that puzzle. The more we can fill in, the better the story is going to be, and the clearer the picture will be in history for those coming after us. We'll do the same thing again today. So if you can and will, please get in contact with us. The program directions will be at the back of the show, giving you where, when, and how to get a hold of us. And I promise you we'll do anything and everything within our par to make it a good experience for you and for the rest of us. Now, before we start the day, I want to remind you again, this is something that came to my light about two or three months ago. It's a system whereby any guy or gal who has any problems, any veteran, or families of veterans or friends who feel that that guy or gal needs some help, dial 211, not 911, but 211, and it'll put you in contact with whatever help you need throughout the state of New Hampshire. You can't read this, but it's everything from child care to enlistment, re-enlistment. Anybody who has a problem, that's the number. Remember it, 211. If you have friends, pass it on to them so they also can be aware of it. We're doing all we can to make sure the guys and gals get whatever help they need if we can supply it. Now today is another good story, we think. A young fellow here who did his thing way back, and I'm going to ask Tom to introduce himself give you a little bit of a picture of what he looked like way back then, and we'll get the show on the road. Thomas, you're on, if you will, identify yourself, spell your last name for the record, give us your date of service, your rank at discharge, and where you currently live, if you would, please. Thank you, Bob. The name is Tom Kiley, spelled K-E-I-L-Y, and uh, I uh, am a retired lieutenant commander. Of course, I started as a uh, ensign and worked through to lieutenant grade and then uh, was discharged uh, after approximately four years and um, stayed in the reserves and uh, attained the rank of lieutenant and then lieutenant commander uh, by serving out uh, full 22 more years of Navy Reserve duty. So here, here I am and uh, ready to tell my story. Where do you now live so we can get, to get you located? All right, I'm living now at uh, the Birch Hill Terrace at uh, an assisted living uh, facility at 100 Alliance Way. Uh, in Manchester, New Hampshire, and uh, have been there approximately a year and a half. Good show. Okay. Now that we know where you are today, I'd like to go back and see how you developed. For example, can you start us back? Where and when were you born? How was life growing up as a kid? And do you have any family members that were in any branches of the service, father, mother, brother, or what have you, that you'd like to tell us about so that we can find out who you are and where you came from? All right, I was uh, born in uh, Brooklyn, New York. No. And I may not have that full accent, but yes, I was born in Brooklyn. And uh, lived most of my earlier days until uh, Navy days in uh, Westchester County, New York. And um, 
went to um, college in uh, Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. And uh, coming out of college, uh, you knew you were going to be in the service one way or another. And since my college had an NROTC program, which I was not in, I uh, had a lot of friends who were and knew a lot about the Navy from them, and it sounded interesting to me. So I applied for the um, Naval OCS program, Officer Kennedy program, in Newport, Rhode Island, and um, graduated from uh, college in June uh, 1951 and then uh, waited for a few months to get into the OCS program and uh, spent four months there turning us into naval officers. Can I stop you right there, now yeah. that you, you're there? I'd like to go back a little bit before that, though. How was life growing up when you were a kid? Do you have any brothers and sisters, family members in another service, so we can see what's going on? All right. Uh, Being nosy. Yeah, as I said, uh, grew up in Westchester County. Uh, family consisted, of course, mother and father and uh, a sister. And um, my father was in the uh, Air Force in World War I. Of course, it was not called the Air Force. There was no Air Force in World War I. It was called the Signal Corps. And uh, he served there. He did not get into combat because uh, his training was not finished by the time the war was over. <clears throat> um, otherwise, there were no uh, close family members in the service, and um, uh, we, um, uh, well, I'll let you ask the next okay, question. Okay, I'll ask you. When you were growing up, were you active in, in school, for example? Any kind of things that stand out, do you remember that it kind of give you a clue as to where life was all about and how you wanted to take it on. Any sports activities like that? Yeah, well, back in the school days and particularly the earlier years, I remember there used to be a thing called the uh, uh, American Citizenship Award. And uh, it was given for uh, good citizenship. <laughs> and uh, I think we need a little more of, of, of that today. Um, but um, now, what was the next part of your? Well, I don't want to go too <laughs> much. But yeah. just just things you may remember. Were you at, at oh, yeah. any school yeah. activities, and yeah. athletics, yeah. or anything yeah. like that? The, yeah, athletics uh, I was uh, involved with was track. I was a skinny kid and faster on my feet than some others, and um, enjoyed that in. Um, even in uh, junior high school. But then in, in high school, got into um, um, both indoor track and uh, the regular outdoor track. Um, when I was in high school, I happened to have a, a coach come back uh, direct from his army service who was interested in track, and he really was dedicated and worked with the kids very much. We used to uh, do our running indoor season in the uh, Kingsbridge Armory in Bronx, New York, as I was going to Fordham Prep at that time, close by to that. And uh, the Kingsbridge Armory was absolutely huge. Uh, no problem in running uh, half mile races or mile races around the large oval in this uh, armory. Wow. And uh, now, by a, a community effort, I hear that the Kingsbridge Armory has uh, been turned into a facility. Uh, it's no longer an armory. It's uh, been purchased by the uh, government community and is uh, able to produce the largest indoor ice rink in uh, the country. And uh, it 
hopes to develop into a, uh, uh, a wider use in that community. And um, so that's that. And then uh, we did the outdoor uh, uh, running, both uh, uh, short events, long events, cross country. And uh, that kept me very busy during the um, high school days. And then on into college, I kept up with the track. No, it was all just flat, flat track, as I call it, versus hurdles, broad jump, and what have you. Well, I was not in, involved with the, uh, the uh, hurdles, and um, not so much the broad jump. It was more 220-yard um, uh, dashes. Uh, Those were the days. That, that was uh, my, my type of race. Uh, the long ones uh, I wasn't so good at, but I did train in, in cross country. Uh, we would run, um, I can remember, back in school, um, five miles a day just to keep in shape. Where did you, was it out in the country? I, I have no idea what, what Chester yeah. County is about. Well, uh, again, uh, we uh, ran a lot in uh, Van Cortland Park in the uh, upper Bronx. And uh, these places were, were not right by the school, but we, we were willing to travel a little bit to them. And, and do that. And um, uh, cross country was to keep in shape for the uh, shorter events. And um, we would do that as long as the weather allowed and start again as early as the weather allowed. And uh, that took all my time. Uh, I, I did get involved to an extent uh, uh, playing the uh, trombone, and uh, that uh, I wasn't very good at it. You're not Tommy Dorsey. I, I'm not Tommy Dorsey, but uh, I like him. And um, played the trombone in, um, in junior high school. Um, actually, the reason I got started was because I had dislocated my uh, right elbow. And um, my parents thought that that would be a good way to uh, get, get the, the arm moving and uh, using the slide on the trombone. And um, I played that. And, uh, and I played it less in, in uh, high school because I was so wrapped up with track. But I kept on with it in college, too. And um, the... Um, Any marching bands in college or anything? Oh, like yeah. Well, the reason... They actually recruited me uh, because they saw the uh, trombone on my college application. Um, you need trombones in the front line of the football band. And uh, they were trying to make the band larger. And uh, they um, <coughs> recruited me. And yeah, I brought my trombone to practice. And um, I was in the football band, and I was in the... Um, um, the basketball band at college that used to go down to Boston College to uh, play uh, the big tournament games. Holy Cross had a very good team in those days. And uh, I was in the concert band. Wow. And uh, in, in dance band. And this was because there was only a, a one or two other trombonists. <laughs> they needed another one. Well, you were there. <laughs> and. Uh, I, I was not abashed when the music director told me one day, well, you know, you sound like a C-54 with one engine out. <laughs> I, I, I was bad. I, I was bad. But, but you tried. Uh, but, but I was there in the front line of the football man. So uh, <laughs> they recruited me. They got me. And they got the music, too. You get a cake what you have. <laughs> okay, now that's... That, when you went into the service, where did you enter? It, and as far as boot camp goes and so forth, that kind of stuff. Because that all everyone seems to have a little different take as to going from civilian life into the regimentation yeah. life. Yeah, well, we looks on that. Yeah, and uh, entering the service, um, I entered into OCS school in Newport. That was the basic training. 
and um, we weren't out doing uh, that much field work in that. That, w that was study, school work with uh, uh, little more than that. And uh, that ensued for the four months and um, um, very few chances to get uh, breaks from that uh, uh, for leave or even visitors. Uh, you were yeah, pretty well reason. confined yeah, to yeah. Uh, uh, you were there the for studies. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah, to kind of keep a chronology, can you have some, do you have any idea of dates like when something started and when it stopped or when you went from to? Well, yeah, I, I... Make it easy on yourself. I went in the, probably the week before Thanksgiving in 1951. And of course, <coughs> my parents were wondering, oh, what kind of a Thanksgiving dinner are you going to get? Well, the Navy provided a very good one. Cut the bird. They really did. And um, so that was the entrance, and I graduated in March 52, and uh, was assigned to my destroyer, USS Power, John V. Power, DD-839. And um, was on that uh, ship for about a, a year and a half. What were your duties when you started aboard and then as you progressed? Can you get, share that with us? Of course, as um, most brand new officers on a destroyer, they start in the, uh, as an assistant officer in the deck division. And deck division basically is responsible for handling all the lines, and riggings, and also all the, the paint and rust. Chippers. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was an, an, an outdoor job. And um, you began to learn the ship there, learn the ways of the ship. And um, then, of course, there's always a turnover in, in officers on uh, these ships. and. Um, so it came to the point that um, I'd been on for a while in the deck division, and um, they had an opportunity to send an officer to uh, training for anti-submarine warfare. And um, it was interesting how that happened because uh, my sister was due to be married in um, November 1952, a weekend um, after Thanksgiving. And uh, I was at that point, prior to that point, over on an operation called Main Brace, which was a large fleet of ships above the Arctic Circle. And uh, immediately after that uh, project, uh, I was due to go with the ship to the Mediterranean for another uh, set of exercises. But I had heard that this submarine warfare school uh, quota was to be filled by our ship. And I said to myself, well, uh, that would get me out of the Mediterranean to a uh, school in Key West, Florida. And uh, then I could get to my sister's wedding with any amount of luck. So I uh, saw the executive officer and uh, t told him the situation. And I, I played it cool as if I didn't know about this submarine warfare quota. And um, I just said, Am I going to be able to get any leave from the ship in the Mediterranean to get back to my sister's wedding uh, weekend after Thanksgiving? And that was all I needed to plant the seed that uh, my name uh, was a good name to uh, fill that quota uh, without asking to be filled, the one filled in that quota. So I, I did, and um, I got accepted to the quota, 
and to the school and um, got my leave from the school the weekend after the Thanksgiving holiday, which was a, a lull period in the school anyway, and got to the wedding and, and then got back to school. But uh, to get back to the uh, duties uh, on the ship, uh, in addition to that submarine, uh, anti-submarine duty, um, then I also had communication officer duties, which um, involved handling all the uh, publications that were required for the running of the ship, uh, the radios, uh, and the, um, I was involved uh, with the uh, cryptographic machine on the ship and uh, using that and um, became versed in that. And uh, the, uh, the submarine, uh, anti-submarine warfare was the most interesting in that uh, uh, we developed a team myself, a very talented first class sonoman and two third class sonoman. And um, we did extremely well and uh, the uh, captain would uh, say, well, you've, you've scored again in the 90s. You know, most ships score in the 50s. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna pass this score on to the upper echelon because uh, they'll wonder what's going on on this ship to be so good. But uh, we kept at it and actually the, um, equipment we had then was very rudimentary and uh, the uh, technology was uh, at step one, I would say. And um, the um, use of the technology uh, was really like a, a, a TV game in that you, you had your scope, which was like a radar scope and you, you had hopefully a blip on one part of the scope that signified your submarine had been spotted by the sonar that you have, and you had another blip that was your ship, and the idea was to bring them together on the right angle so that you could drop a hypothetical depth bomb. <coughs> and. Uh, we worked at that and it, w it was rather hard because uh, all the uh, fish in the sea, the bigger they were, the more they could present a blip that looked like a sub. Up, yeah. But the key thing was you had to use your ear in that uh, the, uh, the way the, the ping of the sonar sounded. Uh, when you had a sub, you knew it. It was a you know a definite. It wasn't a thud, but it was a definite um, ping, and not just a fishy sound. And of course, the water movement could create pings too. So you you battled all that, and uh, your your team uh, expert as it was spotted the uh, sub, and you made your run. And um, while we were doing this, I would be in charge of the ship, how fast it went, which way it went, port or starboard, hard or easy. And um, we um, uh, kept at this, you know, hour after hour after hour. And then sometimes after you finished your, your two, three hours chasing subs, then it became your time to be a, a watch on the bridge. So life was very busy. Hmm. Now, I'm gonna go back a bit. Uh, you lost me a little bit when you said we started as a team. Now, when you were down to Florida, <coughs> is that where you became part of a team and then assigned to a ship? How did you, how was that work? Well, my, my ship sent me there uh, for the training and there were ships down there whose purpose were to be training ships once you finish the classroom phase of the training in the sonar school. Hands-on experience. And so then you would go out on the training ships 
and with the training subs, <clears throat> and you would practice what you had learned in the um, classroom. And um, they gradually brought you along in the, the techniques and technology. And then you went back to your ship and that then, you came from? And then you went back to the ship where you came from. Now, I was down there training. These Sono men who were the first class and, or third class Sono men, they weren't with me. They had previously been to schools and were already on the ship that I was going to come back to. Okay. And so when I came back, then we, we had our full sonar team and uh, uh, put it all to good use. It's in, uh, you had the same kind of equipment on your ship as you trained on? Yes, so there, yeah, there, yeah. There was no incompatibility there? No, no, that, that was part of the, the mm -hmm. training deal. Yes, yes. Now, where did you go from there? From the, um, the ship duty after a year and a half, and of course, uh, uh, I don't want to leave leave that out uh, without talking about uh, going around Cape Horn. Tell us. And you've heard about Cape Horn as a very formidable place, stormy place. Uh, you're you're right. Um, we went around Cape Horn. We were escorting the aircraft carrier Oriskany, another ship, and ourselves, two destroyers. And um, we were escorting it so that we could be the plane guard ships if there were any accidents uh, while a carrier was doing flight operations. But the carrier couldn't go through the canal and was being transferred from the Atlantic Fleet to the Pacific Fleet, so had to get there by going around the Horn. And so th therefore we were uh, assigned to that, and this was the first aircraft carrier in history to go around the Horn. And um, believe me, uh, when I tell you <coughs> it got so rough there that we could walk on the wall easier the rolling. than the deck. We roll 55 degrees. No top overs? And survived. Um, you had to be very careful, because one, one day I was sitting in the wardroom eating, and my table at the chair, similar to this chair, we hit a a real, real tough wave, and in no time, my chair was knocked over, and I was on the on the deck, and uh, that continued on for a number of hours, and um, we, being a destroyer, small, suffered less damage than the big aircraft carrier, which could not give with the pounding of the water, and. Uh, they suffered a great deal of damage, but it was very interesting because as we came on the Atlantic going into the Pacific, at some point after we got in the Pacific just a little bit, this storm hit us and knocked everything wild for a number of hours, and uh, that uh, is... Uh, Interesting because years later, my wife and I went on a cruise that went around the Horn, and everybody was scared stiff that they were going to get battered in the storms on the Horn. And that particular day, it was smooth as this table here. Mill pond. <laughs> and so the only way they could get a flavor of it was because I could tell my story to the rest of the passengers. A real old salt yeah. then. Huh? So uh, I, I left this ship for an other assignment in uh, what you call a fleet training group, which <clears throat> was a training group to <coughs> train non-combatant Navy ships, oilers, tenders, transports, sub-chasers, tugboats, Minesweepers, 
you, you name it. They, they didn't have any big guns on them. And uh, this was interesting to uh, be on those various types of ships. And uh, one particularly interesting event was when we were required to train some Greek ships that the Greeks had, had bought from us and assigned to their Navy. And uh, they came back to the US with their crews to undergo this training that we would give. And um, they, they were very uh, uh, hospitable in that one time we were aboard the day and it turned out this was part of their uh, pre-Easter fast period. And they were fasting, the, the men on this Greek destroyer. But we were there training. They served us a magnificent lunch, which they weren't eating. Oh. And uh, we felt rather guilty, but they were some of the best pork chops I've ever had. Oh. But any, anyway, the fleet training group uh, was centered in Newport, Rhode Island. And um, during those uh, days, and this was 1954 now, we had Hurricane Carol, which was a very large hurricane. And um, I was the communication officer as well as anti-submarine officer still doing in the, the training work. group. Yeah, and um, I had, you know, all uh, the secret pubs in my custody. And uh, so I was one of the last ones uh, in our building before it was evacuated in this hurricane because it was out on a point in Newport. And um, I was one of the last ones. And um, finally, my boss, commander, McIntyre said, okay, you, you can leave now. I'll take care of the secret pubs. And um, so I, I left. I was taking care of a car for somebody, a buddy in the Navy, who'd gone on another ship to the Mediterranean. And I had his car, and I started to drive it out of our parking lot. And the, the rising waters on the road stalled it out. And I started to worry, but with some help from friends, we pushed it up on a lawn in uh, the um, Newport. Actually, it was the War College lawn. And um, I got it started again and parked it on the highest spot in the Navy base I could find and uh, walked back to my apartment. But getting back to our office building, they finally took the last people out from that office building on lifelines. And once the it hurricane was, was over, that building was bulldozed. It was so badly damaged. So uh, that's, that's another experience with the power of water. Cape Horn and the Hurricane Carol in Newport. Now, how did you do ASW training on uh, an oiler, for example, or, or a tug? Oh, okay. What, what do you use for equipment? Okay, uh, I, I, I've got to clarify that. Please. I didn't do any training oh. uh, ASW on, on that. No, um, my, my main du duty, I probably misspoke, my main duty was uh, uh, in the communications area in this fleet training group. Um, but of course, on, on the Greek destroyer, uh, my anti-submarine warfare uh, came yeah. into use. But you know, it, it was tough on that Greek ship because 
they spoke a certain amount of English, but when they were running their drills and up on the bridge, everything was Greek. in Greek to me. It's all Greek to you, you're all bad. And this, <laughs> well, the strange thing was one time it was scheduled that 11 o'clock of this certain day they were to run a man overboard drill on the Greek ship. So, of course, I was up on the bridge, which is the center control point of a <coughs> man overboard drill. And um, <clears throat> after a while, <clears throat> I asked the executive officer, well, when are you going to have the man overboard drill? So he said to me, we had it. We had it already. Well, it was all in Greek. <laughs> So, so you passed with so fine I was colors. Very, very embarrassed <laughs> with that one, but uh, of course they didn't do that purposely. That's mm -hmm. just the way they normally did it. Now, did you have any other ships you had to work with, like the, the French or the Italians or whatever? No, no. Um, once in a while, we'd get one of these. Uh, I guess you call them baby flat top carriers, which were really just transport carriers. They they didn't do flight operations. So we would go aboard and do the uh, training for them. But no, uh, that was just uh, the only uh, international training we did. Did you have to work through interpreters at all? Or, or use well, pigeon English or whatever? Yeah, we, we got along with uh, their, their English <clears throat> as long as they, they knew that <clears throat> they had to be in the English mode f for me. Oh. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> then the next question is, then next, where did you go? Now, by now, you, you're still a one-striper? You got get another stripe? Well, by now, I, I was lieutenant junior grade. Th one a thin half. another stripe. Yeah, the half stripe. And... Um, we, um, there were two winters. It was so rough in Newport in the winter that we couldn't train ships up there. So one winter they sent us, uh, the whole fleet training group, to um, Ganives, Haiti, <clears throat> the Bay of Ganives. And um, all our ships, came down to us to the training for the winter in Haiti. And um, we got to Port-au-Prince on Liberty uh, practically every weekend. That was uh, about an hour and a half steaming from Gun Ives Bay, Haiti. Rough duty? Rough duty? Yeah. Uh, different duty. Different duty, yeah. Different duty. Uh, we got our share of bum boats, the little mm -hmm. oh, yeah. dories that uh, trying to sell anything and everything. Anything and everything all day long. And um, Haiti is a very poor country. And of course, we've heard about it more recently when their last hurricane came through, which was pretty much of a disaster. But um, <coughs> Haiti was an interesting place. Um, just outside Haiti, just outside of Port-au-Prince, Haiti, uh, was a very, very nice area called Patientville, which was where tourists w would go. Um, they might visit Port-au-Prince for a day shopping trip or something like that, but they'd like to spend their time in Patientville at a very, very, very nice hotel. Uh, it was named Dabala, uh, uh, which happens to be the name of the voodoo god. Oh. And Haiti, Haiti has a, 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 a fair amount of, of voodoo uh, practice. Still practice it? Well, it, or is that for tourists? I, I was just about to say, uh, at least that's what the, they told the tourists, and they they um, showed us Navy guys. Uh, uh, a quote voodoo show, and I think that cost 25 cents, and 
then uh, you could watch uh, after that, you could watch a cockfight for 25 cents. But w we said, no, we don't want to do that. And it turns out that they, they started it up anyway, but the cocks wouldn't fight. <laughs> so, so, so we, we would have, if we'd paid 25 cents, we wouldn't have got our, our money's worth. Yeah, huh? <laughs> How long did that duty last, and where'd you go after that? Okay, I just talked about uh, uh, Haiti, and we came back to Newport for the better months, and um, then we went back down um, again for another winter to Roosevelt Roads, Puerto Rico, where we based all our training out of. Uh, again, rough duty for the winter. Yeah, with a smile. Yeah. Rough duty for the winter. And um, there uh, we didn't get to San Juan uh, maybe, maybe once, because that, that was quite a trip. Uh, but I, I will say this, that during my time in uh, Roosevelt Roads, <clears throat> I was planning to um, go to graduate business school and get an MBA, and the test time, they were giving it in San Juan, test time came along and I was in Roosevelt Roads and uh, I wanted to get to the test. So I talked to the commanding officer uh, and we did have some planes assigned to our unit uh, for some of the drills we were running. So he arranged one weekend, uh, one, um, it wasn't weekend, it was midweek for one of the planes to, um, run me up to San Juan oh. um, as a passenger. It was a two-seat torpedo bomber type. And um, so I got, I got up there and I got the test taken and um, um, that eventually led me to uh, Columbia Graduate Business School after I got out of the Navy. And uh, I was a, a very cooperative, uh, CEO that I, I had to arrange to do that. And, uh, and then, of course, at the end of that weekend, the uh, plane got me back. We got back to our normal uh, Normal station. grunt work, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, uh, it, um, it, and then um, after we finished that winter down there in Roosevelt Roads, we came back to Newport again. And um, <clears throat> assumed our uh, training in, in Newport, and four of us bachelor officers decided to get, <clears throat> uh, hopefully, get an apartment uh, in uh, Newport um, instead of living on the base in the bachelor uh, officer quarters. So we worked that deal. We, we got uh, permission uh, to um, seek our own lodging. And we um, were looking for the right place for f four guys. It's, it's a rather large apartment. And one of the rental agents uh, came up with the fact that, well, this place called the Playhouse was for rent. <laughs> and uh, would we like t to... Um, <laughs> look at it. And we said, sure. So we went, and it was a you know, beautiful big place on a cove along the, the coast of uh, Long Ocean Drive in um, Newport. So All then, the mansions were? Yeah, this was not a mansion, but it was a big place. And so then we uh, went to interview the owner so that she could see who these people mm -hmm. were she would rent to, and turned out to be a Mrs. Van Rensselaer, who owned, of course, this playhouse. But we interviewed her in this mansion where she lived and owned, and then she owned another mansion along the way. And um, 
rather funny as we interviewed this lady, very, very elderly. She had a companion. So she was rather feeble. And in the no uh, corner of the uh, sunroom where we were interviewing her, we noticed a whole stack of cases of scotch. And the companion said, well, now, I'll uh, tour you the mansion here, if you're interested in looking at it while you're here. And uh, I'll do it because Mrs. Van Rensselaer has a middle ear problem, and she's a little unsteady. But we all looked at the scotch in the corner and decided, well, maybe she didn't have a middle ear problem. <laughs> Who knows? Strong elbow. <laughs> Who knows? So we toured the mansion. Of course, it had an elevator in it. It was monstrous. Turned out that as we thought more about it on this playhouse on the cove, which would have been magnificent, uh, how, how would you like an address as a Navy bachelor officer? I live at the playhouse on Ocean Drive. It didn't work out. It was going to cost us a fair amount of money. We could have done it, but we didn't. We didn't. And well, I think we were wise in doing that. And then um, finally we, we, we settled for a four-room apartment <coughs> in a um, uh, no, we settled for a seven-room apartment in a 40-room mansion in the Newport, pretty near the Hotel Viking. And um, th we named that after the hotel in Haiti. We named it Dabala, the god of voodoo. And uh, all this, uh, and the, the god of voodoo, um, uh, the, the, the symbol that went with that god was a, a snake. So people got t to calling our place the snake pit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about uh, the, the last exciting part of, of my, my Navy duty. <laughs> well, you ended, ended up coiled, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> and when did you actually leave the Navy? And then what did you do? For example, did you join anything like the American Legion, VFW, or go right to work, or go back to school? OK, I left the Navy. Um, in April of 55, and I, I had, uh, not too long before that, uh, broken my uh, collarbone playing softball, and uh, uh, I uh, was wondering whether I'd pass the Navy physical to get out of the Navy. <laughs> but um, got out, and then, um, I was all set to go to uh, the uh, Columbia Graduate Business School in, in the following September. So I went back to a, an old summer job that I had, and um, uh, that was at the uh, Lake Placid Club up in the Adirondacks, where I was a room service waiter. And um, I'd been that during my uh, college days also. So they were happy to have an experienced person back. Good. And uh, so um, I had that for the summer and then started Columbia Graduate Business School, which was a <clears throat> two-year project. I lived at home in Westchester County and uh, commuted to uh, the Columbia University campus. Now, was that in any way on a GI Bill or is that a lot of pocket? No, this, this was a uh, GI Bill, which was one of the best things that uh, the government did Amen. for uh, veterans then because uh, <clears throat> it was good for the country in getting a lot of educated people uh, <clears throat> and uh, mature people after their service. And um, my object was, uh, as I'd uh, read many business publications during my days in the Navy. Uh, my object was to get to this graduate business school, and then at that point, I knew I wanted to work for IBM, which was a burgeoning, fast-growing uh, company. Um, and so I went to the graduate school at Columbia. Uh, IBM was up there. Uh, 
meeting students, interviewing students, and uh, I got my job with IBM. Good. Of course, they, they were looking for uh, the type of people they were looking for. They were looking for uh, officers who'd had some experience in leading, and um, uh, so it just fit like a glove. And um, first year I worked for IBM was the first year that they'd reached $1 billion in revenue. And they were growing like crazy uh, so fast those days, um, hiring 25,000 people a year, uh, just amazing. And um, so um, every job I, I had in IBM was a job that hadn't existed before. It was growing so fast. And, um, uh, and you grew with it, obviously. Th that, that added to the, the challenge in that y you weren't opening a book and it was telling you how, how to do your job. <laughs> that you, you learned how to do the your job. The blank book you were filling the yeah, lines in. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> today, of course, <coughs> Uh, IBM's revenues are up to 104, 105 billion dollars a year, so uh, it was a good time to join them. It's kind of like the the Apple, the Google, uh, Facebook growth uh, in uh, these days. Uh, uh, very fast. You identify what type of work you were doing. Was it still communication sorts of things, or business decisions, business management, training? Well, to to generally describe, they were all corporate headquarter kind of jobs. They, they weren't out in the sales okay. field m all over the country. <clears throat> and I, I worked in um, uh, systems and procedures, systems education. I worked in a, uh, in a mansion there in Harrison, New York, um, which used to be the TV Sung Mansion in Harrison, New York, which IBM bought up that estate. And um, renovated it for this uh, education situation. Mm -hmm. And um, then I, I went on to um, um, the various assignments, but a few of them stuck out. Um, one was the litigation department. <clears throat> The government had a, uh, a case against us, and um, refresh your memory, this government case lasted against IBM for 13 years, uh, spending a lot of your, your tax money and uh, also, uh, I suppose, the shareholders' dividend money. <laughs> but uh, I, I worked for six years in the litigation support group. I was not a lawyer, of course. But uh, they needed uh, people with uh, solid business methods and practices. And um, I specialized in the privileged document handling, which was a pretty sticky area. And um, I have on my desk at, at home uh, a plaque uh, for the, the last two lines of the case where the government lawyer says to uh, the Cravath, Swain, and Moore attorney representing us, uh, we rest our case. And uh, the IBM attorney saying, thank you. That's what I've been waiting to hear. All these years. It was 13 years. And uh, I was there for six years. That was, that was a very interesting assignment. Used to work all hours. Uh, I'd, I'd be at New York at dinner, and I'd get a call from my wife. Your, your boss wants you up with these 50 people, supervise them. Uh, uh, so I had to leave the dinner in the middle and- uh, Take off. Worked until two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> then, of course, I had another job in, in uh, uh, IBM stockholder relations, which was very interesting. Used to go to all the annual meetings, and um, uh, 
I'd nod to Mr. Watson, he'd nod to me, and he didn't know me, I knew him, and uh, lots of interesting times. I had association with uh, the assistant corporate secretary and the corporate secretary, and um, it was quite a, a different niche of, in IBM, and um, uh, I, I was in charge of all the, uh, the budgets for stockholder relations and the security and the administration and uh, on and on. And within the administration, in those days, we used to do a lot of mailings. And uh, we spent millions and millions and millions in these mailings. And um, today, I I get my annual report. I got it. I think it was May twenty third, and um, not not May twenty third, March March twenty third, and uh, when I was in charge of getting that report out, they they'd say you you got to get it out. It's got to be the, one of the first reports of anybody out, mm -hmm. and I would have to get it out, and. I'd get it out something like January 23rd, very, very early. Uh, and um, the uh, corporate secretary would say to me, make sure those dividend checks you really get out on time and don't get screwed up. Because <laughs> all my, my buddies at the country club razz me when, when they don't get their dividend oh. checks on time. Of course, <laughs> today, People don't do dividend checks, really. They all go Reinvest. into dividend reinvestment or direct to the bank. Let me check you here for just a second. Uh, we're almost ready to wrap it up, but you mentioned something about a wife. Well, where along in your career did you get married, and what was your family life like a little bit, as far as your kids and your wife and so well, forth? Well, we got married uh, a, li a little later in life than uh, some people, but... Um, <clears throat> I guess I was back in 65, we got married, and proceeded to have uh, 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 a, a nice, nice time. We had, uh, well, we had four children, three living today, and uh, one lost at birth. And uh, um, we, um, Jane was a uh, at-home uh, wife, and uh, uh, loved the uh, uh, running of a house and uh, cooking. And uh, uh, she was president of a garden club, uh, president of a garden club that uh, was invented because you know some of these garden clubs get pretty snooty and <laughs> not everybody is, uh, is allowed in. Oh. So this bunch of the gals said, okay, fine, we'll show them. We're gonna have our own garden club, which they did. And uh, uh, it was a very good one, very good one. And um, so we, we lived in Westchester County and we moved up uh, to uh, Dutchess County, have a little more land. I still commuted to uh, IBM White Plains. And um, I always kid, when we moved into this place in Dutchess County, uh, my wife got the swimming pool, my daughter got the horse, my two other kids got college, and I got all the bills. You know, everybody got something. Everybody got something, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, with everything that's been said and done, and it's been great, I think, was your uh, military experience a positive or negative impact on your life? Can you sum it up in something like that? Well, I'd, I'd say definitely positive <clears throat> in that it allowed me to mature, of course, in many ways. And um, it... Um, allowed me to uh, 
uh, see, well, the rest of the world in, in various ways, and I'm not just talking about far off lands. Graphic no. uh, Yes, and um, no, definitely positive. Yes, I lost four years uh, before I could get to school, but when I, I got to school, I'd been an officer in the service, I had my school, those were all the things that companies were looking for. Amen, brother. So, pos very positive. Two words. Thank you. Thank you. Service and for your interview. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Amen. That's a wrap, folks. But before I leave, again, I want to remind you of this. Any guy, a gal, any veteran who has problems or needs help, or you know someone who needs help, Give them this number, 221. It could be the resolution of a lot of their problems. That's a wrap, folks. We welcome you and thank you for being with us. But more important, if you've seen the show and you want to give your shot, please come and see us. We'll do all we can to make it worth your while and ours. Stay healthy. Goodbye. <laughs>